thank you for staying tuned to Urban TV and my name is Edmond Safan and in the special way I'm here speaking to Dr. Gladys Karema about her job as a first wildlife vet. Now Dr. Gladys, I want to understand, you are working with wildlife for all your life. What does your husband feel about your career? My husband really supports my career. Actually, when we, he likes nature. And uh, when we met, before we got married, I told him I wanted to start an NGO. I had finished working at the Uganda Wildlife Authority for four years as their first wildlife veterinary doctor. And I said to him, when I go back to Uganda, I don't want to continue working with the war. I want to set up an NGO, which, not, which does both wildlife vet work and community conservation. Because in my time at UWA, I realized that there were a lot of issues between the community and the park. And there's a way that we could address them through improving the community's health care. And I thought we wanted to set up an NGO that looks at that as well. And so he was the first donor to the NGO with $100. And this was a lot of money for a poor a student, you know, who's also in America struggling to survive. So with that, we opened up a bank account in America and we were able then to register as a U.S. registered non-profit or NGO and then came back to Uganda and registered as a Ugandan NGO, mm. Conservation through Public Health. So am I right to assume that both your love for wildlife ignited your relationship? I think our relationship was there before, <laughs> to re <laughs> but, reaffirm. It's been, but it strengthened it yes. for sure. Mm. Yes, it strengthened it. Together with your husband, you mm. start your organization, Conservation through Public Health. Yes. Uh, that seeks to ensure that people, livestock, and wildlife coexist. Yes. What does that interface entail? And why is it important to manage these three components? We set up Conservation through Public Health primarily because we had a skin disease, scabies, in the gorillas. Another name is Obuhere in, in Richiga, Obuhere in Uganda, which was traced to people living around the national park who have very little health care. And the gorillas got it most likely when they went into people's gardens to eat their banana plants. The problem with gorillas is, is they're not only interested in the fruit, they like to destroy the whole stem to look for water. So people in the community are very upset. The gorilla destroys their livelihood. And they put out scarecrows to chase away wildlife, gorillas, baboons, and other wildlife. And they put out normally dirty clothing. And so when gorillas touch this dirty clothing, because they're curious like us, especially baby gorillas, they're curious like human infants. And then it's probably spread through the group. Because when people go to track gorillas, you're not allowed to touch them. You have to be at least five meters away from them, and five to seven meters. And so that's most likely how they got the scabies. And anyway, a baby gorilla died, and the rest of them only recovered with treatment. And that's, that's when, around that time, we held health education works with the community to find out what they thought about all these issues and to tell them that they need to be healthy to protect the gorillas because they're bringing a lot of income for them and getting them out of poverty through tourism. We found out that many of them were willing to listen to what we had to say and they gave very good suggestions on how to improve the situation. And many of their suggestions are what we used to start the NGO. And so in Buindi, the main issue was this, the people are not against the gorillas, but they didn't like the gorillas destroying their crops. And also the gorillas were making, people were making gorillas sick and they didn't want to make gorillas sick. And they wanted to improve on their health so that the gorillas don't get sick. And also because they also want to get healthy themselves. The health services are very limited. The further away you go from Kampala, as you go further away, by the time you get to the national park, the health services are very limited. So our NGO came in to strengthen the health services of the people, while at the same time we are improving the health of the wildlife and their livestock. Now in parks like Queen Elizabeth National Park, there's a lot of conflict between the cattle keepers and the national park. People want to graze their cattle in the park, the Basongora for example, because that was the, where they used to graze it before. And, but at the same time, the, the wildlife and the livestock can make each other sick. Brucellosis, tuberculosis, 
can go from the wildlife to the people to the community or in between the wildlife and the people. Disease can go either from wildlife to, people, to livestock or livestock to wildlife. And they have a lot of resentment towards the park because they can't graze. And so with our approach of improving the health of the wildlife and the livestock, which they care about, we've made them start to like the wildlife much more and the wildlife authority. And so in that situation, our approach reduced that conflict by, there's, they like the wildlife authority now that they're able to, we've had two instances of them rescuing animals, baby elephants, which are now at Uganda Wildlife Education Center. So these uh, mountain gorillas are so endangered, yet they bring in a lot of money for our mm -hmm. economy. How do communities around the national park benefit from this and um, how important is it to engage them in conservation and tourism efforts? It's um, very important to engage the local community because without them you can not protect the wildlife. For them the wildlife is their day-to-day -day neighbor <laughs> and for you you come and visit it as a tourist or oh, a lovely gorilla beautiful gorilla, beautiful elephant, but for them it can be a source of stress, can destroy their property, sometimes there's, you know, people die because these are big animals, they don't mean to kill people but sometimes it happens, like hippos and buffalo, elephants, so if you don't want these, these community members to kill the animals when they go into their gardens, they have to, you have to gain their support for wildlife. And one very good way to do it is to reduce poverty. Many of these people are very poor. But the moment you engage them in tourism, which is a revenue earner, they can become champions of wildlife. And instead of poaching the wildlife, they start protecting it. And so tourism is one very good way of getting communities to support wildlife. And uh, also other ways, other benefits that organizations bring. So on top of tourism, which is controlled by the Uganda Wildlife Authority, um, there's also the, uh, the issue of better health services, other NGOs are improving their livelihoods in other ways, and so you have to gain the support of the community. If you, without them, conservation of wildlife cannot continue. These are wild animals, really. Mm -hmm. What is the level of risk involved in doing this kind of work, especially for everyone, especially you being a woman. The level of risk is quite high because these are wild animals. And uh, when you're out there with them, you know, they could turn on you. And so we, you just have to be very careful, but we always go with rangers who know how to deal with the, yes, to protect us and know how to deal with them. And we also get to study them and understand how you should behave in front of a gorilla, you know. If it beats its chest, don't beat your chest because you're trying to show it. You're also strong. Are you ready to fight with a gorilla? No. <laughs> <laughs> They're five times as strong as man, so you wouldn't want to take that risk. Um, and, you know, just knowing how to, you can observe them without disrupting their normal natural behavior. So that's very important. Studying them, knowing how to be, you are next to them, and then also working with the rangers. But of course, if we have to treat them, we have to make them go to sleep, anesthetize them, and that's a, a different kind of protection that you need now from the park staff. <laughs> when my doctor Gladys Kalema, mm -hmm. Zikusoka, needs comforting, yes. which words do you use? Do you read a, a book, a Bible? What words do you use? When I need comforting, I, I read, for sure. Um, the Bible is one. I read the Bible every day. But also, I read books. I like to escape and lose myself in books. And, you know, inspirational books. I know that Edmund, you're a motivational speaker. So books like, written by people like you who want to, you know, inspiring books and inspirational books is another way that I can escape and relax. And of course, also, you know, I like swimming and other kinds of sports, hiking things like that. That's also very helpful. In a second, what do you think is the best piece of advice you've ever received? The best piece of advice I've ever received is from a lady who has been a mentor to me too. 
uh, she went out to study orangutans. Orangutans is another great ape, like a mountain gorilla or a chimpanzee, but found on a different continent in Asia. Uh, she's called Birita Gaudicus. And when I went to her talks in London, when I was a vet student, she wrote, and I bought one of her books, she wrote, follow your dreams and the rest will follow. And so that's been words of advice I'd give to anybody, especially young women. Um, a lot of women, when they come out of school, they're worried about getting married. Will I ever get married? Will I have a husband? But actually, if you follow your dreams, you'll find the right kind of husband, the right kind of partner. So I think that's really helped me a lot, and I think it help, can help other young ladies. Thank you very much, Dr. Clavis. <laughs> Thank you very much, Edmund. Sometimes we want to say what other people have just mentioned to us. And what Dr. Gladys has just told us is just enough for you to take for this whole week. Until we meet next week, your coach, Edmund Safari. Some people around us in our vicinity are so passionate about wildlife. And they are so passionate about it that the world through BBC has gotten to know their story through different documentaries, including Gladys the African Vet. On the set is Dr. Gladys Kalema Zikusoka. Welcome to 30 Minutes with Edmond Safari. Thank you, Edmond. So walk us through your journey as a person. I was born here in Uganda, in Mulago Hospital. And I grew up in a family of quite a big family, six people. I was the youngest of the six. My mother was a um, very hands-on mother. She, unfortunately, she had to look up, raise me herself from the age of two because my father was killed in 1972. And so I grew up with her and I grew up with a lot of pets at home. And these pets ended up leading me to like wildlife. So, uh, and you were Uganda's first wildlife vet? Yes. Uh, Specialising in treating wildlife? Yes. How was it like to take on a male-dominated calling? Um, it was, it, it kind of just grew on me because I started off you know, once at the age of 12 when I thought I really want to be a vet doctor, you know, we had many cats and dogs at home and I used to get very upset when they got sick and sometimes I would miss school and go with my mom to the vet to make sure that they get proper treatment. And around the, in my six, when I was in S6, I, at Chibuli Secondary School, I was asked to start up a wildlife club. So I got very interested in wildlife then. And then by the time I finished S6, I felt that I wanted to be a vet who works with wildlife. So I revived the Chibuli Secondary School Wildlife Club. And when I started university, I always had it in my mind that I wanted to be a vet who works with wildlife. At the early age of 12, a normal young girl yes. certainly is playing Kwepena, uh, <laughs> doing all possibly house calls. And then here you are, you're thinking about wildlife. I get so intrigued and I want to know why. Where do you get that passion from for wildlife? I know you're talking about uh, young, you had a lot of cats at home, but where does that passion come from? It mainly came about when I visited the wildlife club offices in Kampala and the Secretary General, Mr. Birigenda, saw that I was interested in wildlife and he asked me to, you know, develop some articles for the magazines and so when I, I went to, this was during my S4 vacation, you know in S4 vac you get bored staying at home and uh, when you come with your parents to town you're like, let me visit the wildlife club offices, they were there on Parliament Avenue. And so when I started S6, the biology teacher wanted to revive the wildlife club and the general secretary of the wildlife club said to him, there's somebody in your school who's very passionate about wildlife who would be a good person to do it. So he approached me and said, I want you to set up a wildlife club. So I was so excited about it. And I spent so much time doing it that I didn't even do as well as I wanted to in my S6. Um, because I was doing physics, chemistry, biology, which are very tough subjects. But because I was so interested in the wildlife, we took the children to Queen Elizabeth National Park. At the time, there was not many wildlife and we could even walk all through the park. 
Um, we had wildlife debates. We did so many things. But by the time I finished all of that experience, I felt that I wanted to be a vet who also treats wild animals. Wow. So how does it feel to be Uganda's first veterinary doctor, especially? Uh, it, it feels great. It was a dream come true because actually when I was doing my veterinary studies in the UK, Royal Veterinary College, University of London, I used to come, used to be allowed to do animals of your choice. So I came back to Uganda. I was able to look after the chimps in Entebbe Zoo. And that time they were, the cages were not very strong and they used to escape. So we used to bring them back in. It was so much fun. So I did that for a week. Then two years later, I was able to go and work with chimps in Budongo Forest. This time looking, working with wild chimpanzees, looking at parasites in the dung and comparing, now it was more related to my veterinary studies, comparing the parasites that they had. And that was also very interesting. And then two years later, I got a chance to actually work with the mountain gorillas. They're very critically endangered. And that time there wasn't tourism to the gorillas yet. It was just beginning, 1994. So there I was looking at parasites and bacteria and looking at gorillas visited by tourists and those not visited by tourists. So it was a very exciting time for me. <laughs> I think I do for people who like wildlife and who like um, doing things which are different. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of its challenges? Some of its challenges. Um, there's lots of challenges working with wildlife. Like? Um, first of all, it takes a while to get to them. Um, for example, with gorillas and chimpanzees, you're not going to drive in a car and find them. You have to go and walk to your patients. Sometimes you have to hike for several hours to find them over very steep hills like Buindi. And then when you get to them, they sometimes don't, obviously they don't know that you're helping them. So you could get charged. I've been charged by gorillas. I've been chased by elephants. Um, so those are some of the challenges. But once you're able to treat them, you really feel great. And once you're able to solve their problem, you really feel great because not only from a welfare point of view, but from a conservation point of view. Every time you treat a critically endangered species like a mountain gorilla, you're helping to save these species for life. For example, I've done an operation on a female gorilla which was six years old at the time, and she recovered. Without the operation, she wouldn't have recovered. And now she's gone ahead to have at least six babies in her lifetime. And in a population of 800 now, that we have 880 in the world and 400 in Buindi, six additional gorillas is a big thing. So it's, it's really great when you can get to treat the wildlife, especially the critically endangered species, because you're really contributing to conservation. And in turn, we all benefit from the tourism. People come to visit gorilla, to see gorillas in the national park. It's one of the biggest foreign exchange earners, not only in Uganda, but in East Africa. And they also come to see, you know, elephants, lions, all these species that with um, care, additional care, you make sure that they have viable populations. How have you used your role to emancipate more young girls to actually contribute to conservation? Mm, I've used my role um, to... I, lost, I, I guess when people read about my work, they get inspired. And I know that there's more female vets coming up. For example, there's one currently working at the zoo and she's looking after, she's a volunteer at the zoo, looking after the new baby elephant which came in recently due to the efforts of our volunteers working in Queen Elizabeth National Park. And so she's been inspired by my work and so have other young women vets. And not only in Uganda but abroad. We host students from Uganda and all over the world in Buindi where our NGO, Conservation Through Public Health, we founded in 2003, improves the health of the people and the wildlife around the national park. And we have students from UK, US, Southeast, Southeast Asia, Argentina, who come over to learn about our work as part of their degree, masters or PhD or their first degree. 
and many of them happen to be women and I think it's because I'm a woman too. Mm -hmm. Now hold it over there and when we be back from that break we shall continue with the conversation. Mm -hmm.